Good morning. It's good to see you. We'd like to begin with a special time for our kids. So, church, help me sing our kids down. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me when I'm good, and I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, but it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. We're building up the kingdom, building up the kingdom, building up the kingdom of the Lord. Oh, brother, won't you help me? Sister, won't you help me? Building up the kingdom of the Lord. It's so high, you can't get over it so low. You can't get under it so wide. You can't get around the jack to go in at the door. We're building up the kingdom, building up the kingdom, building up the kingdom of the Lord. Oh, brother, won't you help me? Won't you help me? Building up the kingdom of the Lord. It's so... You can't, wow. It's so... Thank you. After it's so... You can't get it around it. You have to go in at the... All right, I, I shouldn't have done that. That was all on me right there. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. And today, we get to meet a new baby. Let's come on up here. How do you want to show off Lincoln to everybody? This is Lincoln Bennett Summer. Come on up here with me. This is Mama Summer Bennett and Grandma Tabitha and, of course, grandparents John and Linda. We're so excited. He was born on March 15th, right? Eight pounds, eight ounces, 20 and a half inches long. What a big boy. You like those blue eyes? Man, he's handsome, isn't he? Oh, what a beautiful boy. Summer, we might remember you when you were closer to that size. Now, now look at you. Let's gather up. Let's say a prayer for, for Lincoln. God, we are so thankful for who you are and what you do in our lives. And for little Lincoln and the joy and, and answering our prayers and bringing him into our lives. So be with him as he grows and becomes a, a young man. And help him to grow and become the person you made him to be. And help us to join on that journey and help in any ways we can. Thank you so much for the blessing of this day. In Jesus' name we pray as together we all say, Amen. Amen. Congratulations, hi boy. Oh, what a good boy. Isn't he handsome? And he's growing up just like you're growing up. And that's great. Hey, by the way, do you know what tonight is? Oh, and you know something we have at Trunk or Treat? Candy. Candy? Shocking, shocking. You got that right away. Have you ever heard, has your mom or dad ever said something like this? Don't eat too much candy, it'll make you sick. Is that true? It actually is true. Sounds like some of y'all tried it out. Yeah, there's some people out there that can, can give proof positive. I can as well. You can eat so many sweets that it actually makes you sick. But I hope you come back tonight because we'll have candy. We'll have other prizes. If you come, I'll be out there. I want to see you in your costume if you wore, wear a costume as well. It's going to be so much fun. And you can invite your, your neighbors, your friends. We'd love for them to come. And we'll have carnival games. So many things to do. But... And you're going to get a lot of candy, but don't eat till you get sick. By the way, did you know the Bible describes itself as something that is sweet? In fact, in the Bible, in Psalm 119, 103, it says, Your promises are so sweet to me, they are like honey to my mouth. Honey is very sweet, so it's like a candy. It's like candy in my mouth. It is so wonderful. By the way, you can read the Bible and listen to God's Word as much as you want, and it will never make you sick. It will only make you better. It's one of those things that's always good for us. Well, we're so excited about tonight and so excited to have you here this morning. Everybody's going to wave at you. Wave back at them. Don't forget to wave up, up high to our college kids and our youth group at Lionwood. Yeah, that's where they are. Yeah. All right, let's go back and sit with our family and friends. And we'll think about how good God is. God is so good. Is that yours? We'll take it. Good.
Good morning. Welcome to the Edmund Church of Christ. We are glad that you're here. Whether you're in the room with us or you're joining us online, we welcome everyone a part of this worship service today. It is good to be together. It is good to celebrate what God has done, what he will continue to do in the lives of this congregation, in the life of this congregation collectively, and in the lives individually that make up this congregation. We're glad you're here today. If you're our guest, we're especially glad that that you have chosen to be here today. Let's put the QR code up on the screen. If you don't mind, let us know that you're participating in worship today. Just take out your phone, whether you're a member of this church family or you're a guest, whether you're in person or online, just take out your phone, open your camera app, hold it up there to that code. It'll give you a little link. Click on that link, answer a couple of quick questions, quick and painless. We're not gonna send you a bunch of stuff. We just want to stay connected and we wanna know that you are here, so please check in. You can also use our mobile app. This QR code will be on the screen at the end of the service today. It's also out in the lobby or in the bulletin. Lots of opportunities. If all else fails, you can go by the Welcome Center and talk to Kevin and say, Kevin, I'm here. Check me in, <laughs> and he will do that. Speaking of the Welcome Center, if you are a first-time guest, please go by and meet Kevin. He has a special gift for you. He would love to meet you and to get to know you, to hear some of your story. And whatever brings you our way, we want to greet you and welcome you. Thanks for being here. If you got in here without a communion packet, we have some of those available. You can just raise your hand. The guys will see you, and they'll make sure you get one of those. Just keep your hand up if you need a communion packet. We are using these for communion today. So just keep your hand up until they see you. Well, next Sunday is the big day, 100 years in this community. The Edmund Church of Christ has been around a long time. And we want to celebrate not what we have done, but what God has done in us and through us. It's not about us. It is about him. We are excited about next Sunday. I'm going to say more about that in a little bit later. But I hope that you are making plans to participate in all the day's activities next Sunday. What a wonderful opportunity for us to not only be reminded ourselves of where we are and who we are to be where we are, but it's a great opportunity for us to make contact with this community and people in our neighborhood and our neighbors and our friends and let them know what God is doing through this church family. It's an open door for conversation. And so I would hope that you would take advantage of that. Invite your friends. Say, hey, our church is 100 years old. Come and help celebrate with us this Sunday. What a great opportunity that would be. Um, so take advantage of that opportunity. That's next Sunday. Again, I'll say more about our schedule in just a minute, but we want everyone to be a part of that special celebration. And thank you for what you have done this past week with our 100 points of light, really letting the light of the Lord shine through you as you serve and interact with people in our community. That's what we should be doing all the time. And I hope that maybe something uh, this past week or a couple of weeks, God has inspired in you to continue to, to serve your neighbors, to, uh, to reach out to those around you and, and let the, the light of the Lord really shine through you. What a great opportunity we have. Well, it is good to be together today. We've come together um, to worship. We've come together because we love God and we want to acknowledge, among others, who he is. And in acknowledging who he is, we are reminded who we are, that we belong to him, that our lives are surrendered to him. And as we surrender our lives to him, as we offer our, our bodies, our lives to him, that is a spiritual act of worship, Paul tells us. And so this morning is our collective time of worship so that we can go out into the world and offer our bodies as a worship to God. So let's worship with all of our hearts this morning. As we begin, if you don't mind, let's stand together and let's begin by reading from God's word, Revelation chapter 4. John gets this beautiful vision of the throne room of heaven. And here are some of the things that he witnesses. And let's reenact this uh, wonderful throne room scene as we read this passage together from Revelation 4 verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the
you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we're grateful today for our lives, for the health that we enjoy, for the relationships that we have in you, both in our families here on earth and in our spiritual family as well, Father. Father, we're especially grateful for your creation, the beautiful weather that we've enjoyed, the rain, it's so refreshing. Thank you for sending it to us. We needed it. Father, thank you so much for the faithfulness that you show us in so many ways. It's because of that faithfulness, Father, that we have hope in you and in your Son. And we're grateful for the grace that you've given us, an unending river of forgiveness that we all need every single day. Father, be with us this morning. Help us to be focused on you, to demonstrate to each other our, our belief in you, our faith in you and thereby encourage and build each other up. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
This morning's sermon uh, is going to have us look at uh, Mark chapter 4. We all know the story. Jesus has just got finished sharing some parables. He and the disciples go out into the sea. Jesus falls asleep and a storm comes up. The disciples, as it says later, are very afraid and they wake Jesus up and he just speaks. And the storm calms. His, his response to the disciples afterwards may seem a little different given that we probably would have responded the exact same way the disciples did. You're out in the sea, storm waves are crashing inside the boat. You're afraid. You're scared. You don't know what's going to happen. This situation was yet another display of Jesus' power and authority but he asked those disciples two questions. He said, why are you afraid? And he follows that up with a question he didn't really expect to be answered, but to be thought about. Do you still have no faith? Like the disciples, we have storms in our lives. And when those storms come, we get afraid. And we lose our focus. Instead of focusing on the power and authority of Jesus and all that he's done, we focus on the fear and all that maybe in our minds could happen. When that happens, our faith is compromised, or maybe the word is shaken. And when our faith is weakened, perhaps the best thing that we can do is to refocus on Jesus and remember who he was, who he is, and most importantly, what he did. You see, Jesus Christ suffered for us. We understand that. Do we believe it? He knew that the only way we had any hope at all was if he were to suffer that cruel death on the cross. He knew that was the only way we could be reconciled to God. And also, in his wisdom, he knows us. And he knows that we need to have times where we refocus, where we're reminded, or at least have an opportunity to be reminded of how blessed we are to have a Savior that was willing to come down on this earth and to sacrifice for us, even though we were never going to be worthy of that sacrifice. That's part of the reason that we have communion. We call it the Lord's Supper is to remember what Christ did for us. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 also reminds us that each time we partake, each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're proclaiming the Lord's death and all that means until he comes again. This time that we set aside in our worship service is truly a time to remember. May it never be a rote exercise that we just simply go through. May it always be a time where we really try to focus on the victory through Jesus and his sacrifice.
Would you bow with me as we pray for the bread? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you instituted, that you set aside in our worship service, Father, that we would focus on your love for us, Father, on your willingness to give your son for us, Father, to provide a way. Father, we pray that each and every time that we gather here, that we truly focus our minds and our hearts on all that Christ did for us. Father, we pray that uh, as we partake of this bread that represents Christ's body, that body that hung on the cross for us, Father, we pray that we will be mindful of that. We will understand that. And we will partake of this in a way that you would be pleased. Father, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. bow with me again as we pray for the cup. Father, again we come to you thanking you for Jesus, for his sacrifice, for your love and his love, Father. We thank you for the blood that he was willing to shed, Father, that blood that was necessary to be shed, Father, that blood that was shed for each and every one of us. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, may our minds focus on the cross, focus on the sacrifice. Pray all these things in Christ's name. That concludes the Lord's Supper, but uh, we also set aside a time uh, to give back as we've been blessed. As you can see on the screen, there's many ways that you can give back to the work that's done here at the Edmund Church of Christ. We encourage you to do that. We encourage you to look into your abilities to give. Would you bow with me as we bless the offering? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you bless us with, Father. The things of this world, Father, that you've given each and every one of us, we, we just thank you for those things. Father, as we have an opportunity to give back to you and to your work in this corner of the kingdom, we just pray that we always recognize not only the need to do that, Father, but consider it a blessing. Father, we pray that you'll be with those that make decisions regarding these gifts, and we pray that uh, you give them the wisdom that they need uh, to utilize these funds in a way that furthers your work. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, we This morning's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 36 through 41. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It is now time for children's Bible hour and toddle time. If you're here and have a child between the ages of three years old and second grade and would like them to participate, we invite them to. And then we have toddle time for those that are younger and also nurseries. And uh, you can follow the folks in the crowds as they exit uh, towards the back of the auditorium as we stand to sing this next song. Please be standing. When peace like a river
Questions spark conversation and stimulate learning. When we ask, we learn. Jesus asked many questions during his ministry, but most of Jesus' questions were not asked to learn something he didn't already know. His questions were usually asked to teach us something we need to know. What can we learn from questions Jesus asked? As we look at one of the questions Jesus asked, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 today. So if you have a Bible or a device with the scriptures, you might turn over to Mark chapter 4. I would encourage you to not just be a passive consumer of our teaching time today, but to be an active participant. I think we have an opportunity every time that we're in a class, any time that we're hearing a sermon, we have an opportunity to search the scriptures and to, to really be an active part of the discovery process and what God is revealing to us. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 today. Before we get into the text today, though, let me again remind you, next Sunday, Centennial Celebration, November 6, 100 years as a light in this community. Here's the schedule for the day. It's also printed in the bulletin. Full day of activities. Let me just run over a couple of things. We have an early service, a worker service in the chapel. It's at 8, not 8.15. But you guys don't care about that because y'all are late service people anyway, right? 8 o'clock in the chapel for those who need or want that. And then from 8.30 to 9.30, over in the gym, we're going to have breakfast and fellowship time together. It's not just donuts. It's more than donuts. It'll be a great time of fellowship, a great time to see old friends, to make new friends, to encourage each other. So that'll be 8.30 to 9.30 in the gym. And then at 9.30, classes, not our normal classes, uh, different classes, main, three main classes <clears throat> taught by former ministers. One will be here in the auditorium one in the fellowship hall, one in the chapel, and you can read more about those in your bulletin. Also, our uh, Spanish-speaking ministry will have a special class inviting Bob Young back to, uh, to speak with that group, and then our campus ministry will have a special class and reunion over in the quad. So a lot going on at 9.30 next Sunday, and then at 10.40, we're all in here together. So that means a few things. That means it's going to be crowded. It's going to be crowded, so please be a gracious host, and that means Park away and sit up close, okay? Park away and, and sit up close. Yeah, if you come in Sunday morning, help people find a seat, but also if you could sit down as close as you can, we need to fill in all of these areas. We're going to be packed. And so squeeze in and act like you like each other, and we'll, we'll get through a, an hour service uh, sitting closely together. We do want to be gracious hosts next Sunday. We want to do that every Sunday, right? But next Sunday, you're going to have lots of opportunities to do that because we're going to have a lot of guests here. Like I said last week, if someone's sitting in your pew in your spot, it's okay. It's all right. We're going to forgive them for one Sunday, right? We're just going to go find another spot closer to the front so we can leave those seats for our guests. And then that afternoon, by the way, next Sunday is time change day. Did you know that? We, 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 yeah, something else going on. So we'll, we'll change our clocks next Sunday, and because we uh, lose a little bit of daylight, uh, we're going to, at 4.30, gather in Angel Park. We have a, a great and exciting announcement about Angel Park and some plans that we have uh, to bless this church, but also our community, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to have a prayer of dedication over that, over that space, and we're going to spend some time in fellowship together, and there's going to be food trucks and we're going to give you a meal ticket or a meal voucher. So your meal is included at the food truck. We want as many people as possible to be a part of that wonderful time of fellowship and a prayer of dedication over Angel Park. So again, a lot going on next Sunday, but we want you to be a part of it. We want you to reach out, to go on your Facebook and whatever else, and, and if you're connected to former members, maybe local or maybe at a distance, invite them back. At least invite them if they can't be here in person to tune in to the live stream, we want them to be a part of that. It's going to be a great day. And like I keep saying, like we all keep saying, this isn't about us. This is about God. What a great opportunity it is for us to point to God, to point people to God. What God has done, what God continues to do in the life and through the heart of this congregation. We are blessed to be a part of this church family. All right, so in Mark chapter 4, we see the question. And it's an important question from Jesus. It's a question that all of us, I think, have to face quite often. It's a question that I personally feel like God is sometimes just looking me in the eye, asking me this question. And here's the question, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Fear is something we all experience, don't we? 
Now, maybe we don't call it fear. Maybe we call it anxiety. Maybe we call it worry. Maybe we call it stress. But fear is something that all of us understand. We experience. Sometimes we live in constant fear. For some reason, this time of year, we go looking for fear. People may pay money to be afraid. They go to scary movies and haunted houses. I don't do that anymore. I've, I've timed out on those things, which means too old for that. I never really enjoyed those things anyway. I just did them because my friends were doing them, right? Peer pressure. And now I'm, I'm too old to care about that. So I, I don't do those things. But, but you don't have to go looking for fear in this world, do you? It's, it's everywhere. We understand that there are things in this world that make us afraid, that cause us stress, that cause us anxiety. But here's the thing about fear. It can do good work. Sometimes fear does good things because fear is an instinctive uh, feeling. It's a response. And so if you feel a, a threat or you perceive a threat, whatever that threat may be, you're afraid, uh, you know, you're alarmed, you're going to do something. You're going to act to avoid, if you can, that, that threat. Last weekend, I was down at my parents' house and was doing some work for their house, and my siblings were with me. My brother and I were outside pulling weeds and trimming bushes, and we were on the side of the house, and, and I was just noticing on my parents' gate to the fence that goes into the backyard, there's one of those big black and red signs that says, Beware of dog. I thought, they don't even own a dog. <laughs> there hasn't been a dog in their house since I was a teenager, and I had a dog. Why do they have this sign there? I'm like, Dad, why do you have that sign there? My dad likes that sign. He keeps it on there because he thinks it discourages intruders. <laughs> that they're going to see that sign and go, oh, we can't go in there. There's a dog in there. Are you sure? I don't hear any barking. I don't see any evidence of a dog. No, there's a sign. There must be a dog. But you know, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you go up to a house, I know this has happened to me. You know, when you're on a mission trip or you're doing a door knocking uh, project and you, you uh, approach the house and you see one of those signs, you're like, oh no, here we go, right? You knock on the door and then you hear the bark. <laughs> like there's a Rottweiler, there's a pit bull, there's something in there that's going to eat me, I got to go. See, that's what fear does. Fear triggers a reaction. Fear triggers or prompts a response. And so fear can do good work, but fear can also be crippling, can't it? especially chronic fear. And really, it comes down to a choice that you and I have to make. And it's not necessarily the choice, am I going to be afraid? The choice is much deeper than that. The choice is, what are you going to do with your fear? What are you going to do with your fear? And so let's get to Jesus' question. And then, in this text, begin to peel back some of the layers and really talk about and think through and explore this tension-filled tug-of-war between fear and faith that we often live in, that we often experience. So in Mark chapter 4, as Marty said, Jesus has, has just um, shared some parables, some stories that reveal the true nature of the kingdom, that point to the kingdom of God, this, this otherworldly kingdom that Jesus is revealing in his teaching, in his life. And so the people are listening to these parables about the kingdom, and many of them are about to see the power behind the kingdom. So in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, let's look at this text again. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall broke, uh, came out, came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus and his disciples are in a boat, and there's some other boats there. They're going across the Sea of Galilee, which is really a lake, a huge lake. This lake is situated in a basin. It's a beautiful area. This lake is is beautiful. The Sea of Galilee is just quite a sight to see, especially at, at sunset. But it's located in this basin with hills and mountains surrounding it, and so sometimes the cool air from the Mediterranean comes over and clashes with the warm, humid air in that basin. And when that happens, a storm can quickly rise up. That's what happens on this day. A storm comes up. And what is Jesus doing in the storm? 
Evidently, he's asleep in the stern of the boat, positioned on a cushion, which is probably like a, a sandbag that's used as a ballast in the boat. But these disciples, some of them are fishermen. This isn't their first rodeo. They've been on the open waters before. They've seen storms before. But on this day, how do they respond? How do they react? As that boat is certainly moving up and down in the swells of the Sea of Galilee. And as the waves are washing over, crashing over the side of the boat. If you've ever been out on a boat in a storm, you know that feeling. That is... To me, that is one of the worst feelings in the world. And as the boat is moving up and down in the swells and the waves are washing over, how do the disciples respond? What do they do? They respond like most of us would, in panic and in fear. And notice what they say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? First of all, notice how they address Jesus, teacher, rabbi. You've been talking this whole time. You just told us all these stories, all these parables. We need some action. You know, don't just be a teacher. Won't you practice what you preach? We need you to do something. Don't you care? And they question Jesus's concern for them. I mean, think about that. Don't you care about us? Because in our minds, we know that if you really cared about us, this is what you would do. Boy, how many times do we do that? Maybe you know what it's like to face a terrifying, an overwhelming circumstance, a storm. And you feel like God is asleep. Don't you care, God? Why don't you do something? Not just something. Why don't you do specifically what I want you to do, what I think you should do, what anyone would do in your position if they truly cared about me? Maybe you know what it's like to go through the storm and feel like God is distant or disengaged from what you're going through. You're just hanging on for dear life, bailing water out the whole time. What is at the root of the disciples' panic, of the disciples' response? It is fear. And what is fear? Well, here's my definition of fear. Fear is a reaction to the unwanted possibility of bad news, that something bad is going to happen. And it's not just something bad, it's something horrible. I mean, play this thing out, that's what the disciples did. They were playing this thing out, water keeps coming in the boat, the boat keeps going up and down, this storm is not showing signs of going away, we are going to drown. This boat is going down, it's going over, we're going out, this is not going to end well. Does your mind ever do that? Does your mind ever race with fear and anxiety as you play out the possible scenarios? We often skip ahead, don't we, to the worst possible scenario. Yep, I'm going to lose my job. Yep, we're not going to have any money. Yep, I have cancer. Yep, she's going to break up with me. Yep, this whole thing's going to fall apart. Yep, we're all going to drown. That's what we do. You see, that's what fear does. It backs us in a corner. It backs us in a corner and it says things are bad and they're going to get worse. It propels us from this present moment to a future moment when everything is horrible. It's no wonder that fear is so debilitating, that it cripples us, that it's so damaging. So what did they do with their fear? They did the only thing they knew to do. They woke Jesus up. They woke Jesus up, who was somehow sleeping during this violent storm, which I think is just incredible. But don't miss the irony here. In their deepest, most profound moment of need, they needed Jesus to do something. What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. It won't be long before Jesus is in Gethsemane. In his deepest, most profound moment of need, what will some of those disciples be doing? Sleeping. They wake Jesus up. He gets up. I wonder if he like stretched for a moment. Kind of looked around. And then he began to speak. He had a conversation with nature. Back in our text, verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet. Be still. 
Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see what happened there? The disciples went from one fear to another fear to a greater fear. In fact, when you look at the text there, in your English Bible, there are two different words used, right? Afraid, why are you so afraid? And then they were terrified. In the original language, they are two different words. What's interesting is the second one, terrified, it's actually repeated. It's like fear upon fear, double fear. They went from one fear to a greater fear. First, they were afraid of this storm that they had no control over. And then, They were terrified of the one who has control over all of nature. They ask, who is this? Who could this be in our boat with us? And that question, who is this, is the thesis for Mark's gospel. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes and arranges these stories about Jesus in such a way as to answer that question, who is this? Jesus. He must be more than just a mortal man. Anyone who can get up and speak to nature and calm the wind and calm the waves and still the storm, he's not just an ordinary person. I can't imagine being on that boat that day, the realization coming over them. And after calming the storm, With just a few words, what does Jesus do? He turns to his disciples and he asks that question, our question today. The question, why are you so afraid? Two-part question, do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? What does it mean to live from a place of faith rather than a place of fear? What does it mean not to let fear and anxiety control us? To explore those questions, I think we need to first understand or at least talk about the unique relationship between fear and faith. You see, at first glance in our story, it appears that Jesus presents faith and fear as a dichotomy. That you can't have faith if you have fear, and if you have fear, you don't have faith. Like he was comparing apples to apples, or not him, but us as we read this text. That faith is a polar opposite of fear, right? After all, Jesus said, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? Your fear is up here. That means your faith is down here. And we even package this relationship, don't we, with this expression, faith over fear. And I think this text and other texts in the scripture really validate that expression, faith over fear, as long as we understand what it means and apply it in the right way. Because like so many other things in our world today, that expression has been commandeered. It's been taken. And in many respects, it's been weaponized by some used against others who see things differently on certain issues. So what does it mean to live, to function from a place of faith? You see, the Bible tells us what faith is. While faith and fear uh, often work in opposing directions, to say that they are total opposites is really an oversimplification. There's more going on here. You see, because fear is a feeling. Faith is an action. Fear is an emotion. Faith is a decision. And so it's really not comparing apples to apples. As I said, the Bible tells us what faith is. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is being sure of what you hope for, being certain or being sure of what you cannot see. Well, how can you be sure of something? Where does certainty come from? We sometimes say, I feel certain about this. But certainty is not a feeling. Certainty is a choice. I choose to be sure. Based on what is happening, and sometimes despite what is happening, I choose to be sure of what I hope for in Christ. I choose to be certain of what I cannot see. I choose to see the world with a different set of eyes, spiritual eyes. 
faith and fear can coexist in a person. Consider the father a few chapters later in Mark chapter 9. This father is a desperate father. His son is not doing well at all. He can't speak. He has, the text says, this, this spirit about him, this evil spirit. It throws his body to the ground. His body thrashes violently. He foams at the mouth. Do you think this father was afraid? Do you think he felt anxiety? Do you think in his mind that he fast-forwarded to the worst possible scenario regarding his son? Any parent would. You would be so concerned. You'd be so afraid. And Jesus comes along, and he recognizes Jesus, and he says, if you can do something, please have pity on us. And Jesus says, if, I love that, if, everything is possible to him who believes. And I want you to remember, or maybe see for the first time, that desperate father's response, because I think it speaks straight from where many of us live. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You say, wait a second. <laughs> you either believe or you don't believe. What do you mean, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief? You see, those can coexist, can't they? In this complicated web of tension. This, this tug of war going on inside of us. And maybe a, another way to say it is, I do have faith. Help me overcome my fear. Again, fear is a feeling. It's an emotion that drives us to action. Remember the beware of dog sign? You see that, all of a sudden you're afraid there could be a big dog there, and so you do something. You act on that fear. Faith is an action. Fear can drive you towards faith. But disbelief and doubt, those are also responses. Those are also actions. And it wasn't that the disciples on the boat in the storm that day felt afraid as much as it was what they did with their fear or what they let their fear do to them. What, did, what happened? They doubted the power of Jesus and they doubted the concern of Jesus. Remember what they said? Don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? Feelings of fear and anxiety will produce something in you. You will either let that fear convince you that you need to take control, that you're in a situation where you feel out of control. Don't you know the disciples felt that way in that storm? We can't control this. We can't do anything. You know what that feels like. We all do. And so fear can, can prompt you to say, I need to grab control. I need to take control of this situation. And many times what we do is we say, God, you are not in control. I'm going to take over. And we live and we act like we're the only ones in the boat, like God is not in the boat with us. Or sometimes fear draws us to a place of disbelief and doubt, and we question the power of God or the concern of God. God, don't you care? Don't you care what I'm going through? Any good God would care and would do something. Or you can allow that fear, that normal fear that you feel, to take you to a place of complete surrender and trust. So here's the bottom line. In the face of fear, act in faith. When you are faced with fear, act in in faith. Again, fear is about control or the lack of it. And I may not be able to control what is happening to me, but I can control my response. And a faith response to fear admits that I have no control, that I have to look to God, that I have to surrender to Him, to the one who has control over everything. And as great and as powerful as I perceive this threat to be whatever that threat is whatever that storm is the truth is God is greater and God is more powerful Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell are not two sparrows sold for a penny yet not one of them 
will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You see, whatever you fear most in life, and I'm not, I'm not talking about dogs or sharks or snakes or heights, those, those fears that get at our hearts, those fears that don't leave us at night, that wake us up, that cause us not to sleep, whatever you fear, it does not compare. As powerful, as controlling as you think it is, it does not compare to the power that God possesses. God is over all and in all and through all. And so it doesn't mean that we charge through life, waving the banner, faith over fear, in such a way that, that shows no spiritual discernment. Faith does not negate spiritual discernment. In fact, faith is born out of spiritual discernment and must continue and grow in the context of being discerning and wise in a community of believers. It also doesn't mean that Jesus is always going to stand up and calm the wind and stop the storm in your life. You know that. Many of you are living through the storms right now. You know what that's like. But it does mean he'll be with you. He hasn't jumped out of the boat. He hasn't left you. His power, his presence are still there. God is with you and that's enough. Let me say that again. God is with you and that is enough. His spirit dwells in you. His presence and his power are still at work in our world today. And while fear challenges God's capacity to do something and to care, faith simply yields to him and acknowledges that his power and his providence is supreme, that he is greater than anything that may come after us, any storm we may face, any threat we may experience. Scripture uses a word for what we're talking about. We sometimes use a word for what we're talking about. The word is trust. Trust. You see, the flaw of the disciples in the boat came down to trust, didn't it? That's what it really came down to. They didn't really trust Jesus. They acted like they were in the boat alone, that he wasn't there. Do you ever find yourself living that way? Living in the boat alone? Sometimes we think that's right. We think we're all alone. We forget that God is with us and that his power will sustain us. Maybe you've seen this little video clip that's all over social media. It's, uh, it's quite comical. I, I muted it because this kid is screaming. It's really loud, but I'll try to describe it. Go ahead and play the video. This kid is hanging on to this rope as he's in the water. He's panicking. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. And then this girl, maybe his sister, comes by and shows him... <laughs> Hey, you can put your feet on the ground. You can stand up. It's okay. So he goes from screaming to immediately like, oh, okay, this is all right. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> I love that video because I think that, that illustrates how many of us live our lives. And my point is not that whatever you're going through is not as serious as it seems. That's not the point at all. The point is, I think sometimes as we are hanging on for dear life, as we are screaming at the top of our lungs to God, God is trying to get our attention and just saying, hey, hey, you can <laughs> put your feet down. You can stand up. You can stand up. It's, it's going to be okay. I think what God is saying to us is you can stand up on the solid ground of your faith. You can trust God. Will you be afraid sometimes? Yes. Are there things to fear in this life? Yes. But fear is a feeling. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? You can let it move you to distrust and disbelief. You can let it move you to a place where you try to take control of God because you say he doesn't have the power or the concern to do anything. Or you can let it propel you toward him. In full surrender, trusting him. Whatever happens. If you're tired of living in fear, give up. Give up control. 
surrender to God. You're fearing the wrong things. However great, however powerful, the things that you fear are, they pale in comparison to the power and the greatness of God. So fear Him, revere Him, submit to Him, trust Him. And that's a choice that only you can make. No one can make that choice for you. Will you make that choice today? And that choice for you may look a little different because you're at a different place in your life. Maybe for some of you, that choice to surrender means literally to surrender your life for the very first time to Jesus. Confessing that you believe Jesus is who he says he is. And you want to belong to him. To be baptized into Christ. To be clothed with Christ. To live as a new creation. Do that today. Maybe for you it means making some changes. Surrendering certain parts of your life that you're hanging on to because you are scared to death to let them go. Let them go. Give them to God. You are not in the boat alone. God is with you. And he does care. And he does have the power to help you stand up. So stand on your faith. If we can do something for you today, let us do that. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor a little room right off this hallway behind me. You can exit out any of these doors, go there. They'll encourage you, they'll pray for you, or you can come down to the front. Maybe today is the day that you're ready to surrender to Christ. Don't wait. I invite you to come as we stand and sing. Let's stand together. My faith looks on to thee. Will you bow with me as we close in prayer? Lord, we love you. We know that you love us. We thank you for your presence in our lives, for blessing us, for guiding us, for being there for us. Father, help us to act in faith. Drive away all our doubts and our fears. We know that you're in control, that you are powerful. You are all powerful and you have all authority. We trust you. Help us when we don't. All this we ask as we uh, go about our week this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good afternoon. Well, good good noon. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Uh, the QR code is a way for you to participate as showing that you are here for us to connect. 
Uh, many people use the app. That's awesome as well. And if you're online, you can do that on your, your screen as well using your telephone or cell phone. And uh, we want, want to connect with people in any way we can. This is a great weekend for this church. And next week one will be a great weekend too. Tonight we're going to do trunk or treat. So we're going to watch a video at this point. and our kids love this event. So come be a part. <laughs> okay. Wait, what did I say? I love candy. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> I know you love candy, so you'll be here tonight. And with all the joy and laughter and everything the family is intended to be, we look forward to it tonight. Four o'clock, okay? Four o'clock. <clears throat> a lot of information in the program. Hopefully you picked up one. If not, and if you're online, you can go to our website and download the bulletin and read it there as well. Next weekend is a great weekend, too. Celebrating 100 years. That's a long time. A lot of people have gone through this church and done great things. But our campus ministry is one of those special ministries that touches lives where people come from all over and go back to places all around the world. So they are having a special alumni reception Saturday evening uh, at four, from 4 to 6 in the quad. And also, as Randy mentioned, a lot of things on that Sunday. Parking is important where you park. Uh, the golf cart should be running. We want to, uh, yes, park far and seat near. So as Randy said... Just remember that. Don't, don't get those backwards. Uh, so anyway, also coming up is the daddy-daughter date night. And there's a slide with information there as well as a QR code that will follow that. They've extended the registration a little bit longer for those who can participate. As uh, Brent said, we love you and the Lord loves you as well. You are sent. <laughs> <laughs> 